We promised you Julius Irving, Dr. J, and let me just tell you before we bring Julius in, the Nets and Marvel present the Dr. J inspired by Black Panther bobblehead to the first 10,000 fans in attendance on Friday, March 6th, when the Nets play the Spurs as part of Marvel Superhero Night. And here is the, the bobblehead I'm showing you on it's yours. Beautiful. It really is beautiful. And it's Dr. J in a black Nets jersey. And ripped, too. Oh, he's ripped. He's got to be very happy with that. Now, he will be in attendance at the March 6th game, watching his first ever Brooklyn Nets game in person at Barclays Center. For those that don't remember, and you should, he played with the New York Nets of the ABA, and he led them to two ABA titles. Uh, the Nets are going to host an exclusive pregame meet and greet with the Doc, which includes a lower-level game ticket and a Dr. J inspired by Black Panther bobblehead for 250 bucks, so brooklynnets.com is where you go for more information, and tickets are still available for March 6th at brooklynnets.com, and we bring in Julius Irving. Dr. J, it's Michael, Don, and Peter. How are you? I'm doing great, guys. How are you guys doing? We're doing great. Have you seen this bobblehead? Because it's pretty impressive. I saw it a couple of days ago. And uh, and I compared it to one of my old bobbleheads. <laughs> it was it was like night and day. <laughs> now I've got to tell yeah. you this. I, I play this game a lot, and I wonder if you do as well. What okay. would have happened yeah. if they didn't deal you to Philadelphia? What I mean, would the net still be oh, in New York? That game. That game. Yeah. That game. That game. Well, you know the the sad irony of that is. With Roy Bow uh, and uh, Dave DeBusher, Kevin Lockery, and uh, Rod Thorne. I mean, I, you know, I had great relationships with those guys, uh, particularly uh, Kevin Lockery and Rod Thorne. And, you know, sometimes when you move on and do something that you and your agent are feeling your best interest, you know, somebody else suffers. Right. And uh, just like leaving college, you know, back in the day after I left my junior year, this, the next year wasn't that good uh, for the class. So, you know, you have to make decisions, though. The only bad decision is no decision. You know, and the fact you make these decisions, you move on. I mean, I think they went out, they got Tiny Archibald, got George Johnson, who was a seven footer and a good shot blocker, and whatever. And uh, probably, we probably would have had a pretty good team there in, um, in New York uh, in 76, 77, as opposed to. You know, joining a new franchise and playing for the Sixers. And, you know, the Sixers made the finals that year, but we were we were we were a very very uh, interesting study in basketball. That that particular group, uh, you know, particularly moving from the camaraderie we had with the Nets and you know the success that we had to you know moving to another state, another city, another team, and and really another journey. And I and I ended up you know staying there the rest of my basketball career. So it just goes to show that that probably was the right place to be because I was able to play 11 more seasons, um, whereas the Nets, you know, moved over to Piscataway for a while, played over in, you know, the college gym <laughs> for a while on that hard floor. And I remember, I remember how my knees felt after playing as a visitor. I would imagine if that was my home court. You know, but I probably would have only played five or six years as, as opposed to 11 just because of that. So I look back on it maybe a little differently than a lot of other people. And, um, you know, the fact that, you know, things do have a way of coming full cycle. I mean, I always I always pull for the four ABA teams. Mm -hmm. You know, I pull for the Sixers and I pull for the Nets and the Pacers and the Nuggets and the Spurs. And uh, the Spurs of all the NBA teams have, have, have won all the championships, but uh, but I still pull for the other three, and I feel like it's only a matter of time. You know, when you look at the other sports, there was the alternative league, the AFL in football, the WHA in hockey. How did mm -hmm. you view yourself in the ABA? Did you view yourself as a rebel league? Uh, I think when the ABA first started, I, I think that, mantle probably would have been appropriate but as we moved on and you know suddenly there were nine teams in the aba and there were 14 teams in the nba and you know guys were making decisions well, what, what, which way are you going to go aba or N nba you know there was uh, the feeling that the, you know there was the experience was going to be comparable in, in either league and, uh, and, you know, I played in the last five years of the ABA. So I missed the first four. 
but I heard a lot of stories about the first four. <laughs> right. It was part of creating stories in the next five, and uh, felt like, you know, when we got to the off seasons and all, you know, the ball players going to play in the summer leagues, played in the Rucker League, and played in D.C. and, and played in, in Chicago. It's all the same guys, you know. It's, I mean, it's the same game. Uh, I, I think just that the feeling there was probably maybe a little more depth on the NBA teams and, and uh, you know, but the, the NBA was looked at as kind of like the slow down brown ball league, <laughs> you know, whereas the ABA was, you know, red, white, and blue America, you know, forever. And, uh, and I think when you got publicity in the ABA, uh, everybody reveled in it. You know, we all enjoyed supporting one another in that capacity, and, and that wasn't the way the NBA was run. Dr. J is our guest here on the Michael K Show. Uh, I got to ask you this. I, I, don't, I don't know if you realize, but I did 10 years of the Yankees with John Sterling. And John mm. was your play-by-play -play guy with the New York. Now, what was he like back then, Doc? Absolutely. Absolutely. You know, um, John, was, John was, was awesome. You know, we were on Channel 9 and Channel 11. Remember those channels yeah. back in the day? Uh, WOR, WPIX. And uh, Bobby Goldshaw worked with him. And, uh, you know, uh, uh, Steve Albert, I think, too. Yeah. Uh, so, you know, there are quite a, a, a few guys who are, you know, Hall of Fame quality uh, analysts and announcers and commentators because they always did their homework. Uh, they always showed up for work. And, uh, and, and we got to know one another. I mean, your players and the, and, the, and the media, you know, always had an am amicable relationship because, you know, that was what helped float the ship. You know, it was one for all and all for one. Was he a and, good, you know, as good a tennis player as he says, Doc? <laughs> I don't even remember the tennis game. I haven't played tennis for so long. <laughs> Did you ever play against him? No, but, he, you know, he tells oh. me these great stories that he was really good yeah. before his knees got shot. Yeah, yeah. Well, I don't know about that one. <laughs> Doc, what are you, uh, how do you feel about the league right now? How much are you enjoying this version of the NBA that we're getting in, in 2020? Well, uh, you know, the league is, has been empowered uh, by having an international audience, uh, having the economics go through the roof. I mean, you know, it's a $24 billion uh, enterprise, and, uh, and, it, and it's driven by uh, partnerships. And uh, and I think the players are you know getting a, a fair share of the uh, the equity uh, with the way contracts are structured now. So I mean it's everybody's happy. <laughs> and I, nobody has anything to complain about. And uh, I think from a fan standpoint, you know maybe the um, you know guys sitting out. What do you call that? The something overload or whatever. Yeah, load, load, load management. management. The load management situation, yeah, that's irked a few people. And I probably, if I was, you know, going to buy a ticket to one game a year and I wanted to see Kawhi Leonard and he's not playing that day because he's, he's sitting out, I'd be a little pissed too. <laughs> but uh, you're going to get a better version of that player in the playoffs if they don't play all 82 games. Um, so, so the league's in good shape. I like watching it. Uh, you know, I enjoy watching my teams. Uh, when I come into uh, Brooklyn and the Spurs are going to be there, you know, there's going to be a little nostalgia there because uh, I was a, a net when we, you know, had to battle the Spurs uh, to get to the ABA title. And uh, that last game was against the Denver Nuggets, actually, at the, in the last championship year uh, for the Nets. It was uh, the Nets and the Denver Nuggets, and and you know a lot of Hall of Famers were in that game. Dan Essel was in the game, and uh, uh, David Thompson was in the game. Of course, I was in the game, and uh, you know that's three that I can remember. I think uh, there were some other guys who were, who were maybe worthy. Ralph Simpson comes to mind, and maybe Marvin Webster uh, did some good things in the ABA, and, and uh, on our team uh, we had Brian Taylor, who hopefully will be up. Uh, as a nominee, you know, one of these years to be able to recognize how good a career he had. Doc, so. Doc I've got to ask you this. I was enthralled by the All-Star Game dunk contest this year, but I don't mm -hmm. understand how you and Dominique Wilkins are in the building and they have 
Common and Chadwick Bozeman judging the dunks. Why weren't you guys sitting there judging the dunks? Because we're not from Chicago. <laughs> you know, they, wanted to, they wanted to make it feel, you know, uh, uh, have some home cook in there. Yeah. And, uh, and, you know, that, I, I think, you know, these decisions are made behind closed doors. Yeah. <laughs> so, so, but if Dr. So, J's in the so house, nobody, he should be judging nobody, the dunk contest. Nobody asked it. That would be a natural thing, but I've done so many of them. I mean, I've done probably more than 20 and uh, gone to, you know, 30-plus All-Star games or whatever. So it's nice to take a break. Did the guy who won <laughs> deserve to win, or did the guy from Orlando well, I deserve think to win? As, I think as it turned out, his, his, his duck was probably better than the one jumping over the seven-footer because that was a little, you know, it wasn't smooth. It was, it was a little shaky, and it was a two-handed, so it was a very safe dunk. Um, and the other from inside the foul line with a little twist in the trail. I mean, it wasn't, it wasn't as good as some of the fifties that had happened before by both, uh, the guys. Um, but you know, it was a 48 and it beat out a 47. <laughs> so close. Yeah. But I, I think the thing you probably have a little angst about, and I do too, you know, the contest went so well. And it was neck and neck for so long, you hated to see somebody have to lose. Yep. You know, it was almost like if they gave two trophies, mm -hmm. who would be mad in the building? <laughs> Nobody. Uh -huh. And, and uh, that's what I thought about it. All right, how about your Nets? Uh, they're hanging in there for a playoff spot pretty much without Kyrie. Yeah. And the next year, you hope a healthy Kyrie, and then you added Durant. You know, is the yeah. sky the limit for this Nets team? Can we talk championship in Brooklyn next year? Well, they automatically have to be contended if you can get those guys. To just If they played 60 games, I mean, each of them, because they're probably going to still go through the load management situation next year. It seems to be a fixture in the, in the league now. There's an 82-game schedule. But I think the benefit of the load management is now you see what you got in the, in the rotation in terms of the next guy. And, and now you go nine deep or ten deep, you know, instead of eight deep. And that's going to help you at playoff time, too, because you're going to know what you're going to get out of these guys. I mean, you know, they, 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 they're compensated. you got 12 guys on the side of the taxi squad. So, you know, you might have 14 or 15 guys available. And when the, when the stars uh, get on the forced rest, uh, you can see what you got other than just in practice. You, you get, they get to play real games. So, so for some guys, it's an opportunity. And, and, and we all know what happened in baseball um, when the star sat out and somebody took his spot and, and, and uh, 35 years later or 20 years later or whatever it was, he still had his spot and the other guy never got back in the lineup. Julius, what, what were your thoughts when Kobe passed? Uh, I, w I was saddened by it. You know, I was uh, moved uh, from my relationship with his dad and his mom uh you know his dad played with me in philly uh, my first year there he got traded in the second year and kobe was born during a decade when uh my wife and i had five children so uh so i kind of you know looked at it at him like uh, another another child you know i, I kind of never my 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 processing of this whole thing in Monday and Tuesday, Sunday and Monday, you know, when it was happening, you know, so many people were saying, well, you know, Kobe is what Michael Jordan used to be, what you used to be, and what, you know, guys used to be in the league. And I, I never looked at the ball player comparison piece because I never related to him uh, that way. I kind of re always related to him as, you know, Jellybean's son. And his greatness uh, was associated with, you know, the titles and the and you know the relationship with Shaq and the, you know, the things we heard and, and saw uh, over over the course of his career. But you know, this was personal. I mean, you know, suddenly a life has been lost, and um, and you know his daughter uh, with him, and this is not something that you know, should happen. This is not something that uh, happens every day uh, to people who you have feelings for and um, or even have a, a, a distant relationship with. So 
I was, you know, I was taken back uh, by it. And, um, you know, I mean, I think it's something that, I mean, we're not going to get over because uh, there's going to be more discoveries, just like, uh, you know, we, we learned that the pilot had a history of being a risk taker. Um, so that doesn't enhance the story. I mean, it just makes it more pitiful in terms of, you know, saying, why did this have to happen? Because it was something that probably was avoidable. Doc, we thank you for coming on. Uh, March 6th, you're going to be in Brooklyn for the first time to watch the uh, the Nets, and the, the mm -hmm. bobblehead is outstanding, and we thank you for giving mm -hmm. us some time today. Awesome, guys. Hey, nice it. talking to you, and take care. We'll All see right. You Good luck. All, All right. right. So you just go to uh, brooklynnets.com for more information, and you could actually be part of an exclusive meet and greet with Dr. J. Uh, so there are tickets still available for that March 6th game at brooklynnets.com.